Okay, coming back. Sorry about that. Pause in our video. So what this is just showing you is that same question that we did tabularly, except now you can see the actual graph itself. So as I as you can follow along, you saw that at, at my one value, there's obviously this giant hole. My limit still exists, but my function does not. And as I follow up uh, the graph at two, I can also see that my limit my limit exists, sorry, at 15, my limit exists, my function value exists, everything. So that was part one of my tabular approach, part two of my tabular approach. So continuing on to limits that do not exist. There are three instances where limits will never exist. The first one you kind of already know. So when would a limit exist? If the limit from the left and the limit from the right approach the same value, then that means the limit at that point exists. Well, the opposite must be true then. If the limit from the left and the limit from the right don't approach the same value, then the limit cannot exist. So this is our, this is an equation that would create something like that. And here's the graphical representation. So as you can see from the left and from the right at zero, we're approaching two very different numbers. My second option would be that my function increases or decreases without bound. What we are talking about here is simply one one major concept. We are talking about our infinities. That's what we mean to increase without bound and to decrease without bound. That's what I am talking about. So I have an example right here, a rational function. So I'm going to show you what that looks like on our graph. So you can see at negative two, I'm going all the way up to positive infinity and all the way down to negative infinity. That means we are approaching infinities, which is a whole other limit slide for us, whole other PowerPoint, whole other video. So what this means is the limit does not exist exist at that point. And our final, uh, our final concept is limits that oscillate between functions. And if you don't know what oscillate means, think about your, uh, like a fan in your house. A fan has an oscillation setting, which allows it to kind of swivel back and forth and give you a nice cool breeze throughout your house. Well, same with functions. We can oscillate between fixed values. And this limit, uh, this tan function actually creates a really funky graph. I'm going to try and show it to you as best as I can. And, you know, like if I kept zooming in, you would see those lines going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And what that means that the limit can't exist because I'm approaching different values over and over and over again. Let's move on to how do we solve algebraic limits. So three basic properties of limits. Okay, if I think of a limit, if I think of that right here, that five as a function, well, if my function is equal to five, that's simply a horizontal line. That means no matter what my x value is, it always has to equal that y value five. So therefore, my limit as x approaches five of, as, sorry, limit as x approaches three of the function value five has to equal five. My limit as x approaches Negative 5,000 at 5 would have to still equal uh, 5. There's a typo right there. That should say 5. That should not say 3. My apologies. I'll try and fix that right over that or something. Okay. That's a 5. All right. Now let's look at a second property. And here, uh, when my limit as, as x approaches 4 of x, so think about that. What is the function value x? That's a linear line straight through the origin, y equals x. So that means at 4, my y value should also be 4. Think about y equals x. So if x equals 4, so should y. So what this means is anytime you just have simply x, you're just going to have that, that, that approaching value is going to always be your answer. And finally, this is where we're going to tie into our next topic of direct substitution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 8 and plug it right in here. And 8 to the 4th, now I don't expect you to know that off the top of your head, but that's 4,096. You can plug it into your calculator if you don't trust me. Okay, here are basic properties of limits beyond what I just talked about. All of these are intuitive. I The sum rule, so I can add, okay, so if I take a limit of a function plus a function, that's the same as the limit of the function f plus the limit of the function g, like it's pretty intuitive properties here. But let's move on to our concept of direct substitution. That really is what it sounds like. I'm literally directly substituting in whatever I am approaching. So let's do that. Let's plug that in. That becomes I replace all my x's with one and I solve. It's as simple as that with direct substitution. So my answer here was negative 15. Here we have another direct substitution. So I plug it in. I finish the solve. And we are know that our limit as x approaches 1 is equal to 3. Another direct substitution. And here's where I remind you, trig is important. You have to know this. So the cosine of pi over 6, I could use my hand trick and figure out that it's the square root of 3 over 2. 
And finally, we have direct substitution of a tangent function. So again, I could do my hand trick, and that's going to be the square root of the bottom over the square root of the top. They're the same. So if I do direct substitution, my answer should just be 1. But what happens when direct substitution does not work, when it fails? And what I mean by that is in this example right here, if I plugged in 1, If I plugged in 1, what's going to happen? Well, first of all, what's happening on bottom? You know that's going to equal 0, 1 minus 1. But on top, we have 1 plus 5 minus 6. That's 6 minus 6. That gets me 0. And what does that mean for me? That's an indeterminate form. 0 over 0 is a major crazy concept in math. So... That is something that we cannot have. We don't like 0 over 0, and we definitely don't like 0 in the denominator. So let's try a different approach. Follow up top. We're going to factor, cancel out, and substitute. A quick and easy trick when I'm factor, cancel, substitute is to look at what's on bottom. If my denominator is something as simple as x minus 1, well, in order to cancel that out, I should have x minus 1 on top. So that's an easy helper. It's a little hint if you are struggling with factoring. So let's look at what that looks like. So I have x minus 1, x plus 6. I'm going to cancel out my x minus 1. Then I'm only going to be left with x plus 6, so I re-evaluate. So I factored, I canceled, and now I'm going to do direct substitution one more time. So I apply this 1. 1 plus 6 is simply 7. Here we have another one. Again, if I plugged all this in, I'm going to get at least a 0 on bottom, but we're actually going to get 0 over 0. So I'm going to factor, cancel those x plus 2s out. Get a new limit function, plug in negative 2, and get my value of negative 8. I think we got one or two more here, so I factored it out, canceled and got a new limit. Direct substitution, got an answer of negative 5. Okay, here we got a funky one because I don't know how many of you guys remember your cube factor property. So I've placed the positive, or sorry, the negative one, a cubed minus b cubed. Uh, make sure you review a cubed plus b cubed as well. Just Google it. Um, so that simply shows you that we have an algebraic formula right here for you. In this instance, my a is going to be x and my b is going to be 1. So if I factor that out, I just followed that formula and plugged it in, and I, and I can cancel out now that x minus 1. So when I resubstitute back in, I have this new limit function, plug in, and I get a real value. But what happens when factoring doesn't help me as well? Well, we have one other option for us, and there's two other things that we'll talk about in class, and we'll go through a little flow chart. But uh, there's one other option for us, and that's these special trig limits. And I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but this is simply memorization. You just have to memorize these concepts. So uh, this is a basic question. Of course, we can use properties to apply these special trig limits with other values. Like if I had sine of uh, 2x over 2 or anything like that. So, oh, there is. Oh, I see. Never mind. Never mind. This is not a basic limit. We've got a 2 right there. My apologies. I wasn't even looking at the question. So sine of 2x over 2. So we can relate that back to this one right over here. And so what that means is the sine of x over x is going to be 2. Well, if I pull that 2 out, then my answer should be 2 times 1, which is just 2. Okay, I've got some practice problems down there for you. If you want to do them, please do. I've got the answers coming in. So here's that practice problem one. Here's your correct answer. The next practice problem. Here's your correct answer. The next practice problem. Correct answer. <laughs> problem. Answer. Problem. Answer. Problem. Now, Real quick, I'll pause on this one. Make sure you attempt this question. It's going to seem funky, but just follow your pattern. What do I do with this A? I'm going to try direct substitution first. So I'm going to plug it in for every X value. Okay, this is a special trig one. This is an absolute value function. If you're struggling with this, please come talk to me. Otherwise, um, we will go over this in class. And again, here, just follow what you're looking at. Don't get scared by all the funky notation. Just, you know, hey, I've got this. Let's start plugging that in. Let's see what I've got. Can I evaluate f of 0? Absolutely. So just kind of try your best. All right. Thank you so much.